Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Martin and let's give him a big hand. Annyeong haseo. Pangap sumida. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here speaking to you. It is a big honor to come to Korea for the first time. It's also a good reminder of uh, when I'm, I'm traveling in a country where I don't speak the language. You've just heard all of the Korean that I speak. And it's a good reminder when I travel in a country where I don't speak the language of what it's like to live with a communication disorder because I don't always understand what's going on around me and I know that I have to work especially hard to be understood. And that's what our clients go through every day. So it's a very valuable lesson. Um, I wish that every client with communication disorders could be surrounded by people as welcoming and as accommodating as everyone has been here. Um, so I thank very much the faculty at IWA and to my uh, graduate student chaperones um, in my visit so far. The topic of this lecture is how we can better improve our assessment as speech-language pathologists of phonetic detail in children's speech. And the way that I'm looking at this is largely through studies of how adults perceive children's speech. Um, to some people, this is an unusual topic to look at because we are typically interested in how children perceive our speech. We know that children who have hearing impairments have problems acquiring language, and that even children with normal hearing who have subtle perception problems often have difficulties in acquiring language. Um, I'm interested in the opposite, how adults perceive children's speech, uh, and I would, like to argue, I would like to convince you throughout this lecture that understanding this topic should lead to a better appreciation of the relationship between speech production accuracy and other aspects of speech and language development, and a better way of measuring how children's speech production accuracy changes as they progress through treatment for speech sound disorder. So, to elaborate on that last slide, I start out by asking why should we care about how adults perceive children's speech? Well, the first uh, argument that I make is one that is simple, um, and it's surprising that we haven't thought about it previously. Much of what we know, or what we think we know, about children's speech comes from studies of adults using perceptual judgments. When speech therapists or uh, linguists are phonetically transcribing children's speech, they're essentially doing a perception task. They're being presented with an often unusual speech signal, and they're writing it down with a set of phonetic symbols. Um, and yet only recently have we begun to study systematically how well adults, including speech language pathologists like you, can perceive and denote, that is, write down, detail in children's speech. Second, and related to that first point, the ability to perceive phonetic detail, fine details of production in children's speech, is of great importance to the field of speech language pathology. And so we might ask ourselves whether or not we can devise a task that is better than phonetic transcription, a task that makes it even easier for us to write down even more detail in children's speech than we can with phonetic symbols. So in part of this talk, I will explain to you the different rating scales that I and my colleagues have developed to improve phonetic assessment of children's speech. And I'll talk about how speech language pathologists, people like you, differ from untrained listeners on these different perception tasks. And then finally, with a better understanding in hand of how to measure children's speech production, we, can, we will end this talk talking about discussing what new things we can learn about speech sound development and disorders as a result of this uh, improved knowledge and improved measures of children's speech. So I will be talking about a series of experiments in this talk. And these experiments, by and large, examine the production of coronal fricatives in children acquiring a variety of languages. So I will talk about the S and theta sounds of English in words like think and sink, uh, I'll be talking about the retroflex um, palatoalveolar and prepalatal sounds sh, sh, and sh 
in languages like Mandarin and Japanese. And even though I will be talking just about those sounds, uh, this isn't to say that, um, I'm, that th those are the only interesting sounds for development. Rather, I choose these sounds because, first of all, they have interesting cross-linguistic differences, and cross-linguistic differences are very important in speech-language pathology as we live in an increasingly more global world, but also because these sounds are relatively later acquired, and so looking at them gives us a way to focus on one particular class of sounds that's subject to a very protracted developmental time course. We'll, we'll be looking at adults' perception of children's speech, and so to start, you might ask where I'm getting the speech samples um, from. So in this, in this talk and in the experiments that I'm describing, we looked at how adults perceive children's speech using productions from a cross-linguistic study of phonological acquisition that my colleagues and friends Jan Edwards and Mary Beckman collected about, beginning about 10 years ago. They call their project the Pytologos Corpus. So you see the Greek letters there. Um, this is a Greek word that they coined that just means child words. So Pyto, child, logos, words. Pytologos, child words. The Pytologos project involved uh, collecting data from children acquiring a variety of first languages monolingually. Um, so data were collected in the US, children acquiring English, in uh, Songyuan, in northern China, in uh, uh, children acquiring Putonghua, in Tokyo, children acquiring Japanese, in Seoul, children acquiring Korean, uh, in Thessalonica, Greece, children acquiring Greek. Uh, there are lots of languages. I've, lo I've lost count myself. Oh, um, and children acquiring Cantonese in Hong Kong. A lot of why Edwards and Beckman were originally interested in doing cross-linguistic studies related to things that I won't talk about today. They related to things like how differences in the frequency of occurrence of sounds in these different languages might drive phonological acquisition. And indeed, when they look at frequency effects in things like English and Cantonese, they find that they are present across languages. More frequently occurring sounds are produced more accurately. But for the purposes of today's talk, it just provides a rich source of children's productions, um, children of different developmental ages, the children were two to five years of, old, of age, to use as stimuli. Okay. Now, let's start out by reviewing a study that will be, to some of you in the audience, very familiar. And it's familiar because I talked about it in greater detail at a seminar that I gave on Thursday. So those of you who heard this before will have to bear with us. This will be a bit of repetition, but it's instructive for the rest of the audience. So we'll first start out talking about the difference between s and sh in English. And this is something that my colleague Fang Fang Li, along with Jan Edwards and Mary Beckman, studied and published about in the Journal of Phonetics in 2009. Um, they started out with an interest in how children acquire s and sh, in English and in Mandarin, and also in Japanese. Um, and they wanted to start out by looking at adults' productions. So they came up with a series of measures that they thought were appropriate for characterizing the difference between sa and sh. The two measures that they used were a measure of the, where the concentration of energy is in the turbulent interval in the fricative, the s or sh interval. Um, the measure that they used was a measure of average frequency called centroid. The higher values of centroid mean that there is a smaller cavity in front of the fricative constriction and therefore a more front place of articulation. They also measured the second formant frequency of the following vowel at its onset. So now you'll be remembering back to your speech science classes. This uh, measure relates to the shape of the tongue behind the constriction. So in Japanese, as in Korean, has a very high tongue body behind the constriction, whereas in English, has a very low tongue body position. And this is reflected in the second form and frequency. Plots of adults' productions of these sounds, um, adult speakers of English on the left and Jap oops, Japanese on the right, are shown here. Each one of these 
points is an individual production. The blue are s and the red are sh in English or sh in Japanese. On the x-axis is the centroid measure, the measure of where the tongue is on the front back dimension. On the y is the onset second form and frequency value, the value that shows what the tongue shape is behind the constriction. You see that in English, the difference between s and sh is really a difference just in place of articulation. But in Japanese, the difference between s and sh is a difference both of place of articulation and of tongue shape. What happens when we look at children's productions? Well, if we look at the productions of children who are acquiring English monolingually in Ohio, U USA, or children who are acquiring Japanese in Japan, we see that the acoustic characteristics of their productions of target s and sh are, uh, to use an English expression, all over the map. Um, they aren't well separated into two clouds of data the way the adults are. They vary in their tongue position, anterior, posterior, and they vary in their tongue shape. Now, what if we took children's fricative productions and we played them to adults? So what if we took the children's productions of fricatives combined with the vowels that came after them and we took them out of the words that the children produced them in. So instead of hearing a word like uh, sugar, which is obviously the English word sugar, or the Japanese word shukurimu, which is <laughs> obviously not an English word or a Korean word. It is the Japanese word for cream puff. Right? So what if we take shu and shu outside of those words? We excise the consonant vowel sequence and we play them to adult speakers, native monolingual speakers of English in Minnesota, USA, or Japanese in Tokyo, and ask them, what consonant did the child say? Did the child say an S or an S? Well, what we find is what we see in these bottom plots here. And actually, because this is a long slide, why don't you do the translation for the first part, and then I'll continue the slide. Okay, well, what we see when we do this perception experiment is what is shown on the bottom figure. And this has been published in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. Now what you're looking at is a plot of the acoustic characteristics of the children's productions. And the colors that are plotted atop the children's productions are what the speakers of English and the speakers of Japanese perceive the children's uh, speech to be. The red squares are the productions by children that were see, perceived to be sh. The blue triangles are the productions that were perceived to be s. What you see is that there is a larger part of this space for English that is uh, composed, uh, that comprises tokens that are perceived to be s. For the Japanese listeners, there is a larger part of the space that covers the tokens that are perceived to be sh. Now, why is that interesting? Why do we care about that? Well, what I, uh, the motivation for looking at this initially was that English and Japanese have different patterns of acquisition for sh and s. In English, s is acquired before sh, but in Japanese, sh is acquired before s. Now remember that in the Pytologos project, my colleagues Edwards and Beckwin were interested in um, how differences in the frequency of occurrence of sounds uh, relate to acquisition patterns across languages. Well, they found this difference between the acquisition of s and sh in English and in Japanese, and they couldn't explain it by the frequency of occurrence of the sounds. And so that led us into this endeavor of trying to understand how adults' perception of children's speech might drive cross-linguistic differences. One example that I was thinking of yesterday um, was an, another example of uh, how adults' perception of children's speech influences acquisition. This is an example from a language that you all may know, Korean. So Korean has three types of stops. You all know this. Um, in the phonetics literature, the English-speaking phonetics literature, we call them tense, lax, and aspirated. 
Um, one of the languages that the Pytologos project examined was Korean. And uh, the main investigator on that project was Gong Eun Jung, who is now a professor at Korea Aerospace University, who I had dinner with last night. And she reminded me, she's an old friend of mine, uh, and she reminded me that she has an interesting finding from the tense stops. They are the ones that are acquired earliest in the Pytologos data. And she reminded me that one of the reasons why they're acquired early is because tense stops have two things that are uh, critical, a short voice onset time and a high pitch in the vowel right at its onset. Well, as it happens, children are really good at producing vowels with high pitches because they have high pitched voices. And children are pretty good at producing short voice onset times because that's sort of the natural way that we produce speech. We begin our voice when we open our mouth. So the tense stops are produced accurately early because the children are already doing the things the adults want to hear, right? The adults are uh, ready to label the children as producing speech correctly because the children are naturally set up to produce the things they must do to produce tense stops. So thank you to Kong uh, Zhang for reminding me of that. So we were very excited about this finding from our study of English and Japanese. And we became interested in understanding better the limits of what we can get adults to do in studies where they rate children's speech. The next topic that we tackled was the topic of um, children's acquisition of the S. Uh, we continued to examine children's acquisition of S and SH in primarily in English, although I do have data on Japanese on this slide just uh, for um, uh, illustration. Uh, the next topic that we were interested in looking at uh, deals with the gradual nature of acquisition. So if we look at phonetic transcriptions of children's speech, children appear to go from producing an error to producing correct speech almost instantaneously. So one day a child is producing something that we transcribe as an error, and the next day we're suddenly transcribing this as correct. And as speech therapists, uh, speech language pathologists, this is something that we are happy to see. Uh, it means that the child has made a, a gain. But we, when we look at finer grained measures of children's speech production, we actually see that children's acquisition is a little bit more gradual than those transcriptions would suggest to us. The plot here is showing a plot of productions of S and S and SH by English acquiring children, Japanese over here, of various ages. This is a cross-sectional study. On the y-axis, we have this measure of centroid frequency. Remember, that's the measure that tells you whether it's a more anterior or posterior constriction. Now, when we look at the cross-sectional study of children from age, oh, it was about 28 months to 72 months of age, we see that what's going on is not a an abrupt acquisition of the s sh difference, but rather that s's and sh's become gradually more different from one another. The sh's become gradually more sh-like, the s's become gradually more s-like. Now, this notion that sounds are acquired gradually, we weren't the first people to notice that. The gradual acquisition of speech sounds was first noted by Mackin and Barton in 1980, who studied the acquisition of stop consonant voicing in English acquiring children. So stop consonant voicing in word initial position is determined by, uh, is reflected in voice onset time. The duration between when the stop consonant closure is released and when the vocal folds begin to vibrate. In English, uh, it was noted in 1980 that children gradually differentiate their voice onset times over early development. Recent work by, again, uh, our colleague, Gong um, Zhang, uh, showed that this is true in the Pytologos data in a large set of children in English as well as in Korean. So looking at the three-way stop consonant contrast in Korean among tense, lax, and aspirated. 
It's also been shown that whether or not a child is differentiating between sounds really matters. So let's say you have two children who are producing sounds s and sh in a way that you perceive to be identical. But one of those children is making a difference between them, you just don't note it in your transcriptions, and the other child is not. Research by Ann Tyler and colleagues has shown that the child who is making a difference between the two sounds, even though you can't hear it, is going to progress through therapy more quickly and generalize correct production more readily than the child who isn't making a difference. So this really is an important thing to be able to assess and note. There are other reasons to be interested in this gradual nature of phonological acquisition. It seems to be related to other aspects of language development. Um, so I just have all of these Korean colleagues, or colleagues in Seoul, who, keep, who seem to be coming up in this talk. Um, my colleague Jeff Holliday, who works in the Korean Language and Linguistics Department at Korea University, and who had dinner with us last night. Uh, Dr. Holliday and his colleagues found that individual differences in how much children differentiate between S and S are related to age and to vocabulary size. Even beyond the point at which children are transcribed as producing those sounds completely accurately. So the degree to which children differentiate between sounds is clinically relevant, as shown by Ann Tyler's work, and seems to be related to developmental, the developmental age and to overall language development. And here are a series of plots that are more here for show, but they're showing the nice correlations between Dr. Holliday's measure of acoustic differentiation and various measures of vocabulary ability. I and some other colleagues have been able to replicate Dr. Holliday's finding and have found that, it is, that the degree of differentiation between S and S and SH is meaningfully related to vocabulary size even in very young children of the type that we often see in therapy. And so these figures are showing you correlations and a schematic view of the kinds of spectral analyses that we provided for a set of children from a recent longitudinal study that we did. Now, how can we examine this using just our ears? I've um, made the argument to you that this gradual phonological acquisition is important clinically. I've made the argument that it is meaningfully related to other aspects of development, like vocabulary size. But everything that I've told you thus far has been from studies that used acoustic analysis. Now, many of you are clinicians or um, are preparing to be clinicians. And uh, if I asked you how willing you were to do acoustic analysis every single day with children with speech sound disorders, you would probably smile very politely and in your mind think, oh, that would be very hard. Now, one of the things that we could do is um, we could, if we wanted to get, so, excuse me, I, I got ahead of myself. So the next um, part of this endeavor is to ask ourselves, how can we use your ears? How can we use your skilled listener, your skills as a listener, to develop a better measure of children's speech production that can get at more phonetic detail than phonetic transcriptions do? So can we develop a measure that makes you more like a spectrogram than like a phonetic transcriber? Can we, can we, tax your, can we um, stretch your ears and your brains to give more detail than phonetic transcription does? Now, one of the ways that we could do this that isn't much of a stretch is simply we could look at disagreements among people in how to transcribe a sound that a child produced. So what we would find if we took a bunch of productions, like those that were used in Fang Fang Li's study uh, that I described earlier, if we looked at disagreements among a large group of listeners, we would find that the degree of disagreement correlated with how prototypical a sound is. When a sound is definitely, uh, has the definite acoustic characteristics of S or Ash, there is little disagreement among raters. When a sound is intermediate between S and Ash, there is maximum disagreement among listeners. So we could just use a lot of listeners and we could find the sounds for which there was the most disagreement, and those would be the ones that were the most truly intermediate between two endpoints. And that's a possibility, but it requires a lot of people. 
That's one idea. But another idea is to see if we can get you all as listeners to provide a rating that's more like an acoustic measure. So the idea that we've been working with, and that I'll give you a um, preview to the next couple of slides, ended up working quite well, is to supplement phonetic transcriptions with continuous ratings of how prototypical a sound is. So let's imagine taking a sound like the sh in shikrimu uh, and presenting it to a native speaker of English. Well, that production is neither like a typical S in su, an English production, nor is it like a typical sh in shu. Right? The sh of shikrimu is really intermediate between them. Now, phonetic symbols don't give us a lot of opportunity to transcribe something as intermediate. We can write S slash S, uh, then Esh, and then a question mark, right? Uh, and in fact, this is what we often do. We'll just write question mark, right? <laughs> or plus or minus or something like that. But we can standardize this now. We could actually do what people are already doing in their minds. When you write S slash SH question mark, what you're doing is you're saying, it's somewhere between S and SH. Well, let's take that intuition and formalize it with a rating scale, a continuous rating scale like the one that you see here. Now, when we ask people to produce ratings like this, what we find is that they actually have an amazing ability to note small differences between sounds that differ in how S or ESH-like they are. What you're looking at on this plot is, again, that very same measure, centroid frequency, which tells us whether a sound is more anterior or posterior. Um, this happens to be a set of stimuli that includes both English and Japanese productions, the very same ones we looked at a couple dozen slides ago. And on the y-axis here, you're looking at where on the line people clicked on average. And what you see is that when things are acoustically intermediate between S and S, uh, between S and SH, people click at a location on the line that is intermediate between the S endpoint and the S endpoint. So essentially, people are able to do what they've already been doing informally in many of the clinical assessments that um, you all do. I was seeing lots of nodding heads when I talked about writing down question marks. One additional thing I'll say about these experiments that are, uh, that's not on the slide is that when we, uh, when we initially devised these experiments, we were quite apprehensive that they wouldn't work. Um, and so the fact that we immediately got data like this that suggests that they work was encouraging. What was surprising and especially encouraging was how much people like these experiments. When you take someone and put them in a sound booth and ask them to judge whether s is s or sh, they get very angry because they know it is neither. Right? They get, well, angry, perhaps there's a cultural component to that. Americans get angry. <laughs> um, but you know, they could just as easily get confused or feel deceived because you're giving them two options and they know it's neither. Right? So no matter how many times you tell somebody, it's OK to guess, everybody wants to do the experiment the right way. Every one of you wants to transcribe children the correct way. And when your transcription system doesn't allow you to transcribe something the right way, it's angering or stressful or whatever your specific reaction is. But it isn't pleasant. Right? People would come out of the sound booth after an experiment like this and say, finally, a speech perception experiment I can actually do. Because you presented things to me, and I knew when they were neither of the endpoint sounds, and I knew exactly where they ought to go. So this was uh, very encouraging and quite surprising and very striking. Uh, I never expected to see happy participants in a research experiment. <laughs> now, of course, there is the worry that this is just going to be a fluke that it's just one experiment that worked. But we found that, these continue, that we can replicate this finding across languages and across a variety of sounds, not just the fricatives that we're talking about today, um, but across a variety of sounds and languages and across a variety of laboratories. So it isn't just that people from Minnesota are really good at this. People are good at it if they're in Stockholm or if they're in uh, New York City or if they're in Seoul, South Korea. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so Dr. Gong has done this with um, people rating the stops, the tense lex and aspirated stops of Korean as well. Now, this is very interesting and, and very good in that the strong correlation between these visual analogs, we call them visual analog scale ratings, VAS ratings. The strong correlation between these VAS ratings and the acoustic characteristics of contrasts, um, it's, useful, it's, it's useful and exciting for many reasons. Um, one is that it simply gives you a new toolkit as speech language pathologists to write down more detail in children's speech than is possible with phonetic transcription. But it also gives us uh, an opportunity to look at variation in speech sounds when the acoustics aren't really clear. Uh, I'll give you a good example of this, which probably is um, meaningful to you all as second language speakers of English, and that is American English R, the, the R sound. Um, there are some acoustic measures that people have proposed uh, characterize that sound, a, a low third form and frequency. But when you go in and look at children's productions of that sound, and when you look at a diverse set of adult productions, uh, we actually don't really know what the acoustics of that contrast are. And that makes it very hard to look at in children because we don't even have a good model of the acoustics for adults. But now that we have visual analog scale ratings, we can just have people rate children's productions with a scale that says the R sound and the W sound on the other end. And sure enough, we get lots of variation. OK, so one example of a sound contrast whose acoustic characteristics are poorly understood is one that is very important in the acquisition of English. And that is the difference between S and F. Um, one of the reasons why this contrast is important is because F for S errors are common residual sound errors in children acquiring English who have uh, a, a persistent speech sound disorder. So producing a theta-like S is a common and very socially stigmatized error for older children. Um, so it would be very nice if we could characterize the development of S and theta by children acquiring English. Uh, but our um, uh, our acoustic measures for that are poor. And so even if we were going to go in and do an acoustic study, we wouldn't really have solid ground to be standing on. We might ask then, how useful is VAS for tracking how S or theta-like children's productions of these sounds are? So to examine this, um, my doctoral student, who is now a professor, Sarah Schellinger, and Jan Edwards and I looked at adults' perception of children's productions of the S and theta sounds using data from the Pytologos corpus. We had a series of 200 stimuli that included lots of different types of productions. So hopefully the audio plays here, things like correct S, <laughs> ah, nice, uh, Instances where children produced something that was transcribed to be S, but the target word had a theta, so things like <laughs> things that were neither, clearly neither S nor theta. And Sarah Schellinger transcribed these as intermediate. And the intermediate sounds Sarah further coded as being either intermediate and closer to S <laughs> or intermediate and closer to theta. She also had, yes, they're adorable. Uh, <laughs> she also had productions of theta that were um, theta productions for target S. So this is the classic S misarticulation error of children with residual speech sound disorder. And then correct theta. So we took those sounds and had people rate them on a visual analog scale anchored by the, uh, the S sound on one end and the TH sound on the other end, because the theta is typically written with the TH. And what we found was that listeners, again, could rate all of these different sound categories, uh, the correct theta, theta for S. Uh, when we look at the ratings for these different sounds, we see that people can perceive and rate differently all of these different types of sounds. They rate the intermediate sounds as different from either the thetas or the s's, and they even rate, rate the s's and thetas differently depending on whether they were supposed to be s or supposed to be theta.
So we find that these visual analog scales can be used very readily uh, and very skillfully by listeners to mark very small differences in the phonetic details of children's speech. Now, all of the studies that I have been presenting to you so far used what I'm called naive listeners. So people who were not phonetically trained. They were generally university students and in some cases younger university staff, but they weren't people like you and me. Um, and my immediate thought was, well, if, if people who are clinically untrained can use these types of scales, then surely clinically trained people can use them even better because we are just better than, you know, we have better ears, we have better training. Um, but I had a master student, a clinical student, Julie Johnson, who was a bit skeptical about this. She thought that perhaps the fact that speech language pathologists are so uh, rigorously trained in phonetics, and phonetics teaches us that sounds are either one thing or another, maybe that would mean that the speech language pathologists would be less willing to use these continuous rating scales than lay people. And I said, oh no, Julie, they're going to be better. And she said, oh no, you're wrong. And, uh, and we decided that the only way we could resolve this was by actually doing an experiment, where we took these visual analog scale ratings and we compared a group of lay people, naive listeners, to people like you and me. And we uh, wondered, I, we reasoned that, um, well, she and I had different, we had lots of disagreements about what ways that they should be better and what ways that she sh they could be worse. But if they are better, then they ought to be more reliable than lay people. So they ought to be uh, more likely to give the same rating on different uh, trial after trial. They ought to provide ratings that are more closely related to the acoustic characteristics of sounds than our lay people. They ought to be less biased by external factors. So for example, we might think that naive people would be less likely to rate something as a theta because theta just doesn't occur very often in English words. Whereas clinical speech language pathologists would perhaps be less influenced by that um, fact about language. They would provide ratings that were more purely of the phonetics and not of the frequency of sound's occurrence. And we might expect that they would provide, uh, that they would give ratings, that better listeners would give ratings that used more of the entire scale. So we examined this uh, in an experiment that compared 20 naive listeners with 20 very experienced speech language therapists. Um, we confirmed that the naive listeners spent less time around children and therefore had less experience perceiving children's speech than did the speech language pathologists. We used as stimuli um, natural productions from the Pytologos project of children producing a variety of sound contrasts, S, theta, T versus K, D versus G, so unfortunately the phonetic fonts didn't transfer to this computer. This is theta and this here is G. I don't know what that is now, That's, it's not a hangul for sure. <laughs> Um, we included a variety of productions by children, including ones that had been transcribed as correct and ones that had been transcribed as errors. And we used visual analog scales to elicit responses using response uh, text that was appropriate for the contrast being rated. So this is the text that people saw when they were rating the S's and thetas. we found that indeed the experienced listeners were more reliable. So what you're looking at here is for the three sound contrasts that we sampled, d versus g, t versus k, s versus theta, our index of reliability was always higher for the clinical speech language pathologists than for the naive listeners. What we're looking at here are the average ratings that the naive listeners, the lay people gave, and those are black, in the black bars, and the ratings that the clinicians gave, those are in the gray bars. Um, recall that I said that the sounds that we had people rate um, ex exemplified a variety of different categories, so correct and incorrect productions 
as well as intermediate productions of different types. What this rather complex figure is uh, showing is that the ratings by the clinicians better differentiated among the different transcription categories than did the lay people's ratings. This is a way of saying that they tracked even more phonetic detail than did the lay people's ratings. They reflected more phonetic detail than did the lay people's ratings. This is another sort of fun and complex figure that shows you the average ratings that the lay people and the uh, clinicians gave for each individual stimuli, each individual production that was included as a stimulus. So if the ratings for the two groups were identical, then all of these should fall on the y equals x line. But they don't. Um, what you see is that the clinician's ratings were more likely to cover the entire span of the visual analog scale than were the lay people. Remember I said that we hope that the, the better listeners would not be biased by external factors like how frequently the sounds occur in words. Well, as it happens, the speech language pathologists' ratings don't. They're equally likely to call something a theta or an S, even though S is many times more frequent than theta in words of English. But the lay people were biased by that. So the lay people trended, to, the lay people tended to give ratings that were at the end of the scale that corresponded to the more frequently occurring sound. We also found that the experienced listener's ratings were more uh, strongly correlated with the acoustic characteristics than were the inexperienced listeners. The biggest difference was found for the de g contrast and the smallest for the s theta contrast. The last thing that we look at here is just the distribution of ratings along the entire visual analog scale. What you see in this figure is the clinical uh, speech language pathologist's ratings in red and the inexperienced listener's ratings in green. So all this is showing is where along the visual analog scale people tended to click. And you see that really the groups look quite similar. Um, people can have clusters of ratings at the endpoints of the line, but in general, people really do use the middle of the scale quite a bit, which is what we would expect given that um, endpoint sounds are more frequently occurring in people's daily language experience than our intermediate ones. So, uh, to tie up this ex experiment, we find that experienced speech language pathologists' visual analog scale ratings are more reliable, more closely related with acoustics, and are more, let's say, symmetric, less biased by sound's frequency of occurrence than our lay people's. They also have a slight tendency to use the endpoints a little bit more. So at the endpoints, the red, the modes in the red distribution are a little higher. Um, yeah, that, sorry, I used that. The modes are a little bit higher. Now, you might ask why are speech pathologists, speech language pathologists, uh, different in perceiving children's speech than lay people? So one possibility is that people like you and me, speech language pathologists, are naturally attracted to our field because just by an accident of birth, we have better speech perception. You know, there's variation in speech perception just like there's variation in language ability. And it may be that we were attracted to this field because we noted at some level that we're good at it. Right? Uh, and that's, uh, that's sort of the, um, I don't know, the sort of pride uh, explanation. The, the hard work explanation is that we're better at it because we work at it. Right? That we just spend a lot of time listening to children and working hard at hearing more. Right? That's sort of the, um, the part that appeals to us as interventionists because we would like to think that we can make these kinds of changes. Well, these data don't, say, don't tell the difference between those. But one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm starting to collect data on speech language pathologists in training to see how their perception of children's speech changes as they go through their training program and go out in the world. So perhaps it's the case that there's a little bit of both. Maybe some people come in with natural talents, but everybody gets better with more and more training. Maybe the speech, maybe your ability to perceive fine detail in children's speech is one of the things that predicts whether or not you're going to be more effective with children than with adults, for example, in artic versus in voice. Okay, well this is, it says the halfway mark, which is fairly, which is kind of frightening because uh, I, I've already been speaking for over an hour.
So um, you'll be happy to know that I just have one more experiment to give, and uh, uh, it shouldn't take another hour and five minutes. <laughs> we'll be out of here by noon, I promise you. <laughs> now, the last experiment that I'm going to present to you today um, answers two questions that our work uh, up to this point had raised. And the two questions are, first of all, why are some people more likely to use the entire visual analog scale when making their ratings, whereas other people cluster at the endpoints? So why are some people more categorical perceivers of children's speech and others less categorical? And second, reviewers of our work pointed out, rightly so, that while we were developing these visual analog scales and talking about how great they are, we had never done a systematic comparison between visual analog scale ratings and phonetic transcriptions. So we had never compared the psychometric properties of the two types of scales in a single experiment. And so this is examined in, um, when I sent the slides to, uh, to you all for this conference, it was submitted. Now the, the paper is in press in the journal Clinical Linguistics and Phonetics. So our original motivation for this was uh, provided by the kind of data that you see here, which shows where three listeners in one of our early experiments clicked on the visual analog scale. One of the listeners uh, clicked on the middle of the scale more often than the ends. That's the one shown in blue. Another listener distributed his ratings across the scale fairly evenly. That's the listener in green. Another one had uh, a distribution that had um, peaks at the endpoints and in the middle, um, but other ratings at other points in the scale. Okay, so it's desirable in these visual analog scale experiments to have people use the entire scale. So we want to understand why some people are using the entire scale for their ratings and others are not. And so one way we thought to look at this was to see whether or not we could change people from being ones that use just the endpoints of the scale or just a discrete set of locations along the scale to ones whose ratings were truly continuous. And the way we did this was by constructing an experiment that drew attention to different parts of speech, different um, facets of speech. So, in this experiment, we had people sometimes listening to fricatives and rating whether they were S or theta. And in the same block of, it, of the experiment, they would be listening to children's speech and rating how typically boy-like or girl-like they were. Right? So in that block of the experiment, we thought we were drawing attention to the continuous variation associated with gender identity. In the other block of the experiment, we thought we were, uh, we had people rating the vowel, and we thought that that would draw attention to categorical variation. Okay. So the general design of the experiment was as I just said it, to interleave these visual analog scale ratings of children's S's and thetas uh, with judgments of either a continuous variable, gender typicality, or a categorical variable, which is to to report the vowel that the child had produced. So there were two blocks of the experiment. Everybody participated in both of the blocks. In one of the blocks, S theta judgments were randomly interleaved with judgments of the gender typicality of the children's speech. So people either made ratings of, uh, on a given trial, they made ratings either of whether the sound the child produced was an S or a theta, or whether the child was definitely a boy or definitely a girl on this continuous scale. In another block of the experiment, they made ratings of the fricative, and in the very same block, they judged the vowel that the child produced. Um, the order of the blocks was randomized, and listeners never knew what ratings they were making until the stimulus was done playing. It was the very same S and theta stimuli that were in the Schellinger et al. study that I reported previously. A schematic view of the experiment is shown here. So people did what we're calling a gender block, where they were making the ratings of the fricatives alongside the ratings of the gender typicality, and a vowel block, 
where they were doing the ratings of the fricative alongside a judgment of the vowel that the child produced. But all we're interested in looking at here is the judgments of the fricatives. Were the judgments of the fricatives systematically different in the vowel blocks and the gender blocks? Um, and because uh, the hour is wrapping up, or the hour and a half is wrapping up quickly, I'll just assure you that the stimuli had a lot of variation in them of the type we would expect to see in children of this age. And I'll give the um, results in a, a sort of synopsis format and say that when we use a visual analog scale to elicit judgments of how S-like or theta-like the children's productions were, we didn't find an effect of whether or not the ratings were made alongside judgments of gender or judgments of the vowel that the child produced. So when we used a visual analog scale, we didn't see a difference in people's ratings of children's fricatives depending on whether they were in the vowel block or the fricative block. And so I um, am showing this slide here because it, be, it is an important one when I present the next set of data. So this slide here is showing that listeners' ratings were affected by lots of different acoustic characteristics of the stimuli, but the effect of the acoustic characteristics on listener ratings were similar in the vowel blocks and the gender blocks. Now, remember that people, uh, reviewers of our work um, faulted us for never comparing visual analog scaling to phonetic transcription. So we also did a second experiment where we did use the very same design, but instead of having people make visual analog scale ratings of S's and thetas, we had people do a binary judgment of whether the children's productions were S or theta. And what we found in that experiment was that actually, yes, when people are making binary judgments of whether or not a sound is S or theta, their judgments do differ systematically uh, depending on whether their ratings are made in a block alongside judgments of gender typicality or judgments of the vowel that the child produced. So what this is showing us is that uh, when people are using visual analog scale ratings to denote differences in children's productions, they're less susceptible to bias than when people are making categorical judgments of the sound that the child produced. So in this experiment, we find an additional benefit to these visual analog scale judgments in that they are not as susceptible to condition or experiment-related bias as are the um, binary judgments that are like phonetic transcription. So this is uh, close to the end of the talk, and so uh, I'll just skip ahead and give the summary slide so that there's time for questions and answers. Um, so. What I've tried to argue in the last hour and 15 minutes is that adults' perception of children's speech plays a critical role in our understanding of speech sound acquisition. And in particular, it gives us a particular, uh, it helps us understand some cross-linguistic differences in acquisition that we couldn't understand otherwise. Uh, in the middle of the talk, I argued that given the right tool, adults, including speech language pathologists like you, can denote small differences in children's productions. In the last part of the talk, I argued that these um, measures, these visual analog scale measures, might have an additional benefit um, beyond phonetic transcription in that they might be less susceptible to bias than traditional categorical measures. Um, the last thing that uh, I didn't talk about today, but which is very much part of the work that I and my colleagues are doing uh, this very moment, is um, thinking about how we can take these kinds of continuous measures of children's speech and use them to annotate corpora um, of children's productions, like the Pytologos corpus that provided the stimuli we used in our studies. Um, and how ultimately they might be helpful in helping us, they might be useful in helping us better understand the relationship between speech sound development and its relationship to other aspects of language acquisition, like vocabulary growth. So um, I'll close with my acknowledgement slide. So I'd like to thank you all for listening, and especially to our uh, team of experienced and impromptu translators. Uh, so indeed, collaboration is important. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Dong San Yim, who is uh, on sabbatical right now, um, but for inviting me to Korea, and to you all for going along with her suggestion. Um,
to my uh, longtime colleagues, Jan Edwards and Mary Beckman, and um, to the many grant sources that funded this research and that continue to fund this research. Thank you very much. Thank you.